Toad, said the water rat gravely and firmly. You go off upstairs at once and take off that old cotton rag that looks as if it might formerly have belonged to some washerwoman and clean yourself thoroughly and put on some of my clothes and try and come down looking like a gentleman if you can. For a more shabby, bedraggled, disreputable looking object than you are, I never set eyes on in my whole life. Now stop swaggering and arguing and be off. I'll have something to say to you later. Toad was at first inclined to stop and do some talking back at him. He had had enough of being ordered about when he was in prison. And here was the thing being begun all over again, apparently, and by a rat too. However, he caught sight of himself in the looking glass over the hat stand with the rusty black bonnet perched rackishly over one eye and he changed his mind and went very quickly and humbly upstairs to the rat's dressing room. There he had a thorough wash and brush up, changed his clothes and stood for a, for a long time before the glass contemplating himself with pride and pleasure and thinking what utter idiots all the people must have been to have, to have ever mistaken him for one moment for a washerwoman. By the time he came down again, luncheon was on the table and very glad Toad was to see it for he had been through some trying experiences and had taken much hard exercise since the excellent breakfast provided for him by the gypsy. While they ate, Toad told the rat all his adventures, dwelling chiefly on his own cleverness and presence of mind in emergencies and cunning in tight places, and rather making that out that he had been having a gay and highly coloured experience. But the more he talked and boasted, the more grave and silent the rat became. When at last Toad had talked himself to a standstill, there was silence for a while. And then the rat said, Now, Toady, I don't want to give you, give you pain after all you've been through already. But seriously, don't you see what an awful ass you've been making of yourself? On your own admission, you have been handcuffed, imprisoned, starved, chased, terrified out of your life, insulted, jeered at and ignominiously flung into the water by a woman too. Where's the amusement in that? Where does the fun come in? And all because you must needs go and steal a motor car. You know that you've never had anything but trouble from motor cars the moment you first set eyes on one. But if you will be mixed up with them, as you generally are, five minutes after you've started, why steal them? Be a cripple if you think it's exciting. Be a bankrupt for a change if you've set your mind on it. But why choose to be a convict? When are you going to be sensible and think of your friends and try to be a credit to them? Do you suppose it's any pleasure for me, for instance, to hear animals saying as I go about that I'm the chap that keeps company with jailbirds? Now, it was a very comforting point in Toad's character that he was a thoroughly good-hearted animal and never minded being jawed by those who were his real friends. And even when most set upon e and even when most set upon a thing, he was able to see the other side of the question. So although while the rat was talking so seriously, he kept saying to himself mutinously, But it was fun though, awful fun, and making strange suppressed noises inside him. Kick 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 and poop poop and other sounds resembling stifled snorts or the opening of soda water bottles. Yet when the rat had quite finished, he heaved a deep sigh and said very nicely and humbly, Quite right, Ratty. How sound you always are. Yes, I've been a conceited old ass. I can quite see that. But now I'm going to be a good toad and not do it any more. As for motor cars, I've not been at all so keen about them since my last ducking in that river of yours. The fact is, while I was hanging on to the edge of your hole and getting my breath, I had a sudden idea, a really brilliant idea, connected with motorboats. 
There, there, don't take on so, old chap, and stamp and upset things. It was only an idea, and we won't talk any more about it now. We'll have our coffee and a smoke and a quiet chat, and then I'm going to stroll quietly down to Toad Hall and get into clothes of my own and set things going again on the old lines. I've had enough of adventures. I shall lead a quiet, steady, respectable life, pottering about my property and improving it and doing a little landscape gardening at times. There will always be a bit of dinner for my friends when they come to see me and I shall keep a pony chase to jog about the country and just as I used to in the good old days before I got restless and wanted to do things. Stroll quietly down to Toad Hall, cried the rat, greatly excited. What are you talking about? Do you mean to say you haven't heard? Heard what? said Toad, turning rather pale. Go on, Ratty, quick, don't spare me. What haven't I heard? Do you mean to tell me, shouted the rat, thumping his little fist upon the table, that you've heard nothing about the stoats and weasels? What? The wild wooders, cried Toad, trembling in every limb. No, not a word. What have they been doing? And how they've been and taken Toad Hall, continued the rat. Toad leaned his elbows on the table and his chin on his paws, and a large tear welled up at each of his eyes, overflowed and splashed on the table, plop, plop. Go on, Ratty, he murmured presently. Tell me all. The worst is over. I am an animal again. I can bear it. When, when you got into that... That trouble of yours, said the rat slowly and impressively. I mean, when you disappeared from society for a time over that misunderstanding about a machine, you know. Toad merely nodded. Well, it was a good deal talked about down here, naturally, continued the rat. Not only along the riverside, but even in the wild wood. Animals took sides, sides as always happens. The river bankers stuck up for you and said you had been infamously treated and there was no justice, justice to be had in the land nowadays. But the wild wood animals said hard things and served you right and it was time this sort of thing was stopped. And they got, got very cocky and went about saying you were done for this time. You would never come back again. Never, never. Toad nodded once more, keeping silence. That's the sort of little beast they are, the rat went on, but Mole and Badger, they stuck out through thick and thin that you would come back again soon, somehow. They didn't know exactly how, but somehow. Toad began to sit up in his chair again and to smirk a little. They argued from history, continued the rat. They said that no criminal laws had ever been known to prevail against cheek and plausibility such as yours combined with the power of a long purse. So they arranged to move their things into Toad Hall and sleep there and keep it aired and have it all ready for you when you turned up. They didn't guess what was going to happen, of course. Still, they had their suspicions of the wild wood animals. Now I come to the most painful and tragic part of my story. One dark night, it was a very dark night and blowing hard too and raining simply cats and dogs. A band of weasels armed to the teeth crept silently up the carriage drive to the front entrance. Simultaneously, a body of desperate ferrets advancing through the kitchen garden possessed themselves of the backyard and offices while a company of skirmishing stoats who stuck at nothing occupied the conservatory in the billiard room and held the French windows opening onto the lawn. The mole and badger were sitting by the fire in the smoking room telling stories and suspecting nothing, for it wasn't a night for any animals to be out in, when those bloodthirsty villains broke down the doors and rushed in upon them from every side. They made the best fight they could, but what was the good? They were unarmed and taken by surprise, and what can two animals do against hundreds? They took and beat them severely with sticks, those two poor faithful creatures, and turned them out into the cold and the wet with many insulting and uncalled-for remarks. 
Here, the unfeeling toad broke into a snigger and then pulled himself together and tried to look particularly solemn. And the wild wooders, wooders have been living in Toad Hall ever since, continued the rat, and going on simply anyhow, lying in bed half the day and breakfast at all hours, and the place is in such a mess, I'm told, it's not fit to be seen. Eating your grub and drinking your drink and making bad jokes about you and singing vulgar songs about, about well, prisons and magistrates and policemen horrid personal songs with no humour in them and they're telling the tradespeople and everybody that they've come to stay for good. Oh have they said Toad getting up and seizing a stick. I'll jolly soon see about that. <laughs>